everybody. I am so happy that you chose to join us again on our Mount Sinai of Memphis YouTube channel. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again to thank you for your grace and for your mercy. And Father, we pray that as we study your word, that you would speak to our hearts and our minds, that we will receive you afresh. In Jesus' name, amen. So we are still on article number 13, a gospel church. And our author writes, we believe that a visible church of Christ is a congregation of baptized believers associated by the covenant in the faith and fellowship of the gospel, observing the ordinances of Christ governed by his laws and exercising the gifts, rights, and privileges invested in them by his word, that its only scriptural officers are bishops, pastors, and deacons whose qualifications, claims, and duties are defined in the epistle to Timothy and Titus. And if you recall, our scripture is in total, it's 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 1 through 13. And we have made our way down to verse 10. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 10 through 13. And this is the New King James Version. It says, now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. Verse 13, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? So we've already mentioned that the church of Corinth, the church at Corinth, had lots of problems. But the main problem was division, which is what Paul dealt with first. Every problem that they were dealing with stemmed from the fact that they were divided. And even though there were other problems that needed to be addressed, it would be useless to attack those problems if they were not first united. If they are fighting, what's the point? in attacking other problems when the first problem is that they're not united. Nothing would be effective unless they were brought together. So Paul pleaded with them in the name of Jesus Christ. Whenever there is a problem, especially in the church, the authority of Jesus Christ should be the authority invoked. Paul knew that he couldn't appeal to them based on his own God-given authority because that was part of the problem in the church. Some were following him and others doubted his authority. So he couldn't evoke his own authority without causing more problems. One of the miracles of the church and possibly the strongest proof of the truth of the word of God is that the Christian church has been able to survive, even thrive over thousands of years. All these thousands of years later, our churches are not much different than the church in Corinth. It's not uncommon for our churches in our day and time to be plagued with division, brought on by differences of opinion, which leads to quarreling and it even leads to church splits. My guess is that most church splits have very little to do or nothing to do with doctrine and everything to do with personal opinions and egos. I read a conversation <clears throat> between a mother and a reluctant son that, was, that went something like this. He says to his mother, Mom, I don't want to go to church today. The mother says, Oh, son, I really think you should. But mom, he says, I don't think anybody likes me there. And I don't want to go. Give me three good reasons why I should go to church. 
Okay, first, I'm your mother and I want you to do it. And you should be obedient to your mother. Second, Sunday is the Lord's day. And you know what Jesus said about giving unto the Lord what is the Lord's. And third, you have to go to church because you are the pastor. So in this, Paul pleaded with them that they all speak the same thing and that there be no division. I would imagine that it was difficult at times for Paul dealing with not only the Corinthian church, but other churches. So he wanted them all to speak the same thing and there be no division among them, but that they be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Paul is not asking them to become some kind of in sync robots uh, without thoughts of their own, without you know, just going along with the program. Nor is he asking them to just agree with everything that's going on and passively sit back and do nothing. We live in a fallen world, and the people in the church are fallen people saved by grace. We must never be satisfied with things as they are because things can always be better. There's always something we can do to make things better. So we must constantly work and pray for things to become as they should be. And Paul is begging the Corinthians to set aside their differences and be united in the same mind and same purpose. My point is this, that even though Paul had the God-given authority to make demands, he chooses not to. He knows that he has, a, has every right yet he refrained from doing it because it was in the best interest of the kingdom of God. If there is one purpose to accomplish and everybody has the mindset to accomplish that person, that purpose, then we should be able to listen to different opinions and realize opinions are just that, opinions. And no one group is more right than another group. There's just differences of opinion. But if everybody has the same mind, which is to accomplish the will of God, then with the help of the Holy Spirit, we are able to work through our differences and choose what is best. But we must first agree that that, that is our goal before the meeting occurs. We must first come together to we must first agree to come together to meet, to establish a goal or to work on a goal. Amos 3 and 3 says, and this is the Amplified Bible. It says, do two walk together except they make an appointment and have agreed? The Hebrew word for agreed is yad, Y-A-A-D, which means to make an appointment. It means a time, a betroth, like an engagement, or meet together. It does not mean unconditional, uniform agreement. It does not mean just going along with what is said without thought. The word translated agreed has nothing to do with the attitude or the purpose or nature of the two people while walking together. In other words, the agreement is to meet and walk together, not walking together in agreement. The agreement or the appointment comes before the walking together. We must first agree to walk before the actual walk. You know, it's like if, if, if uh, I wanted somebody to just walk with me for exercise purposes, I have to first call or we have to talk and agree that we will walk together before the actual walking together. It's an appointment to meet and walk. It could very well be an agreement to meet and walk together to hash out differences. You know, if you've got a problem and, and, and two people need to talk, they can agree to meet at a certain time 
to walk and hash out the differences. The word agreed uh, or yod occurs in, in the same form and tense as in Amos throughout the Old Testament. One of the clearest understanding of it is in Job, the second chapter, verse 11, concerning Job's three friends. The Bible says that they came, everyone, from his own place, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. So the words, for they had made an appointment, is the translation of Yod. They agreed, they made an appointment to come to Job, meaning that they made an appointment to meet and then go to Job to comfort him. So in my mind, they agreed to meet at a specific time, at a specific place, and then together go and comfort Job. But anybody that has read or heard about the book of Job knows that these three men did not agree with each other. They argued with each other. They argued with Job, along with accusing Job of being unrighteous, and they accused him of having some kind of hidden sin. So clearly, the three friends of Job did not meet to agree. They simply agreed to meet. My point is that verse 10, which says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. He's not saying that every Christian has to think the same, speak the same, or even worship the same. When Paul talks about one mind, he's speaking of unity, not uniformity. In other words, he wants everybody to come with the mind of Christ, come with uh, the, the mind to, to, we're going to honor Christ, that Christ is going to be in the forefront. As Christians, we should be unified in our belief in Jesus Christ, even though our backgrounds may be different. We shouldn't have the attitude that we can only have dealings with people that are like-minded to us or have the same experiences as us. That makes for a small circle and a closed mind. We should be able to talk to people who think differently from us without getting into a heated argument. Just because a person does not agree with us that does not mean that they're wrong, and it does not mean that we're wrong. But we should have the attitude that I am of Christ. And if they are of Christ, then we're like-minded in that respect, and the Holy Spirit can bring us together. And so we should be able to talk to people who think differently from us and not get into a heated argument. And, and walk away having, we should be able to walk away having been enlightened, or at the very least, we can agree to disagree. If your faith can't handle challenges, then there's something wrong with your faith, not with the gospel. Our unity is not in our wisdom. It's not in our behavior, nor is it because of our background. Our unity is in Christ. As believers, we should have one, that one thing in common, Jesus Christ, which makes everything else come together. It is God's power in the cross of Jesus Christ that has formed all types of people into a community. It covers all races, all nationalities. It's Christ who has brought us all together. And it is God's authority that should be invoked in every disagreement among believers. If we come together in one mind and one purpose, then we live out what, what we really are, Christ's church. That's the only way it can happen. 
God is the only one, the Holy Spirit is the only one who can bring us together and, 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 and bring us into one mind, one purpose, and just allow us to live among each other in such a way that those on the outside will see us and think that we are Christ's church and that might even want to become a part of it. But if we are tearing each other apart, if we are, are literally, and that word division means to tear apart, if we're literally tearing each other apart, who wants to be a part of that? Once again, we've come to the end of our lesson. Join us next time as we continue the Gospel Church. And until then, bye-bye, take care, and see you later.